This presentation introduces the idea of poles and zeros, which are a nice graphical representation of the z-domain system view. Uh, and in the presentation I'm going to make use of an example, and the example I'm going to use is this system here. So I have this discrete system, uh, which is this is the signal flow diagram of the system, which has this corresponding difference equation given by this expression up here. And the system has a frequency response um, given by this plot here, which this plot could be obtained lots of different ways. So we have magnitude against normalized frequency, but this is the frequency response, a rough idea of the frequency response of this system. Um, the z-domain view, and all systems uh, will have a z-domain view, um, they have these um, features called poles and zeros. So all systems will have these features, poles and zeros. Now I'm not going to explain where I'm getting the poles and zeros uh, at this point, but if you can accept for the moment that the poles for this system are given by the positions um, 0 0.65 plus 0.52j and 0 0.65 minus 0.52j. So they're a complex conjugate pair, and poles will occur in complex conjugate pairs for the systems that we're going to deal with. Um, in this case, for this system, and again I'm not going to explain where I'm getting these values from, this system has two zeros located at the at zero. So two zeros located at zero. Um, now, I don't expect you to understand fully what's going on at the moment, but just accept, I'm just trying to introduce some terms first of all. Um, now, poles and zeros can be plotted on an argon diagram. So we could have our real and imaginary axis. And plot the poles and zeros. Um, now this diagram they're going to draw out is a pole zero diagram. Or pole zero plot. And the pole zero plot differentiates itself a little bit from an argon diagram in that it has uh, what's called a unit circle. Let's try to sketch out that unit circle. And the unit circle goes through the points 1, j, minus 1, and minus j. Okay, So the pole zero plots will always have this unit circle. And we can plot the, the locations of the poles and the zeros on this pole zero plot. Um, so the position 0 0.65 plus 0 0.52 will be somewhere around here. Um, the complex conjugate value of that will appear somewhere here. And the zeros uh, will appear in, at the origin. So I have two zeros and you show the zeros by the zero or a circle, um, whereas the poles are showing shown as X's on the pole zero plot. Now, every system will have its own unique pole zero plot, and the poles and zeros are at fixed positions for a particular system. Um, now, the, they can, there can be lots more poles and zeros, so a different system might have zeros, additional zeros positioned here and here, and maybe additional poles labeled positioned there and there. Um, they come in all different shapes and size, and there's no limit to the number of poles and zeros that a system can have. What I'm going to bring up now is a pole zero uh, GUI. Um, and this GUI was put together by a guy called Tom Krauss from Purdue, and he deserves a lot of credit for putting this together, very useful tool. I've modified it a little bit, but um, the, the basic idea behind the tool is it shows the relationship between this view, the pole zero plot, and the frequency response. And that's the key point in this presentation, is that you start to relate the positions of the poles and zeros and how they influence the frequency response of a system. Okay, so I'll just bring up the pole zero plot, the, the GUI now. It's called ZP GUI. Um, and this little GUI has the pole zero plot of the system. So this is the pole zero plot associated with the system that we had on the previous um, um, screen. Uh, and we see that we have the two poles here, and there are also zeros here. 
in the in the center. Okay, and I have the frequency response of the system plotted down here. So we have normalized frequency against magnitude. But I've plotted the magnitude in dB. It's a common way of showing the the magnitude scale. Um, now what, what what I'd like you to come away with is to appreciate how these poles and zeros influence the frequency response of a system. So again, the poles and zeros would be fixed for a, for a particular system. But with this GUI, we can move the poles and zeros around to design a system to have a particular frequency response. Um, so the first thing I'd like you to note is how the poles influence the frequency response. And basically, poles cause amplification in a system and at certain frequencies. Now these poles, we have two poles here, and these two poles contribute to this amplification here in my system frequency response. Okay. Uh, now how those poles um, change the frequency response is as follows. If I was to move the pole, so I'm going to move that pole closer to the unit circle, you'll see two things happening. First of all, the amount of amplification will increase but also the selectivity of the frequencies will also increase. So as I move the pole closer to the unit circle, and you'll notice as well that the other pole will also be moved towards the unit circle, I get this very selective band of frequencies being amplified. Okay. If I move the pole away from the unit circle and towards the origin of the circle, you'll see that the amplification reduces, but also the selectivity is also uh, reduced. Okay. As I move towards the unit circle, it will amplify more and more. And on the unit circle, it's got maximum amplification. Okay, and also maximum se selectivity. Um, so that's one thing about a pole. The second thing you need to know is how to change the frequency that's been amplified. So at the moment, the frequency that's been amplified is 0.1, which is about a fifth of the way along this axis here. Okay, so this is the frequency response of a system. And that really covers from zero up to half the sampling frequency. Uh, so that's a normalized frequency. Now, to change the frequency, I can move the pole along the unit circle. So the arc of the unit circle here, if I move the pole along the arc of the unit circle, we change the selectivity, or not the selectivity, but the the frequencies that are being amplified by the pole. So if I position the pole halfway along the unit circle, we see that the frequencies at one quarter of the sampling frequency will be amplified. So it's a halfway along this axis of our normal normalized frequency axis, those frequencies will be amplified. And as I move it further along the edge of the circle, we see that different frequencies are being amplified. And as I bring it towards the this point here, we see that the frequency the high frequencies are being amplified. So I'm just hoping by way of example that you can see how the poles influence the frequency response. So moving the pole back towards this point over here, that will amplify the low frequencies. Okay. So let's bring it back to about uh, a quarter of the way around. And again, if I want to, to reduce the selectivity or reduce the amplification, I can bring the pole towards the origin of the circle. Okay. Likewise, if I was to bring it three quarters of the way around, and then I want to reduce the selectivity at this point, I can bring the pole back towards the origin of the circle. And if I was to keep the pole at that distance away from the unit circle and move it around, you can see that the amplification and the position of the frequencies will be adjusted. Okay, so that's how a pole will influence um, influence a system. Um, now I could change the pole at this position as well, but it ha from uh, 
negative um, uh, imaginary uh, pole and it has the same effect. So those poles are always exist in complex conjugate pairs. Okay, so that's how a pole will influence uh, the system response. A zero has almost the opposite effect. If I bring a zero out to the unit circle, it tends to reduce the the frequencies. So I'm going to bring the poles, move the poles in towards the unit circle, so they have no effect. But if I leave the zeros out on the unit circle, we can see it causes this dip. And if I bring the the the, the zero we bring it one quarter of the way around the unit circle. We can see that the frequencies one quarter of the way along this axis are reduced. If I bring it, if I position the pole up here, or sorry, zero up here, which is halfway around that unit circle, well then those frequencies will be reduced about halfway along this axis, which you can see. And if I was to bring the pole sorry keep on saying pole but if I bring the zero towards the origin of the circle then the effect is that the selectivity of the frequency is being reduced is also reduced but also the amplification or the sorry the attenuation is also reduced okay now a system can have any number of poles and zeros so I can design systems that have particular frequency responses by putting in more poles and zeros. So at the moment I have a pole one quarter of the way around the unit circle and that causes this amplification here. I have a zero halfway around roughly halfway around and that causes that dip in frequencies or attenuation of frequencies at those fr at those frequencies around here. Um, if I wanted to uh, amplify frequencies at say 0.4 uh, a normalized frequency of 0 0.4, then I could add a new pole into the system and just position it over here. Okay. Uh, if I wanted to reduce the attenuation, move the pole away from the unit circle. Still get some amplification. Okay. Um, likewise, say I wanted to reduce um, DC values, so 0. Uh, all my DC values, I could add a zero and that would cause a reduction in or an attenuation in those frequency values. Okay, so um, I've opened by way of example that you can see how these poles and positions influence a system's frequency response. A system will have um, a fixed set of poles and zeros uh, and once you have those poles and zeros you can go from the pole zero representation into a difference equation representation and I'm going to give you a presentation on that soon enough. Um, now I'm hoping that this example gives you some idea how the poles and zeros influence frequency response but over here as well there's a three-dimensional view which may give some further insight and in the next presentation I'm going to show you how these poles and zeros influence these this three-dimensional plot and also how that three-dimensional plot is related to the frequency response.